Our school is situated beside Australia's largest coastal lake. We take pride in delivering excellent education in a warm and nurturing environment where our students can explore, dream and discover. Our school is located an hour and 45 minutes northeast of Sydney and 35 minutes from Newcastle. We have Chloe Snowden, Danielle Orchard, Emma Connolly, Tegan O'Byrne, Becky Williams, Millie Sargentson and Kayla Fennell. As we all know, the raid on Sydney and the attack on Newcastle were both significant events. World War II began in 1939, and Australia's membership of the Allies meant it was fighting the Axis forces, including the Japanese in Asia. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was equally the same with landings in the Philippines, North Borneo and Malaya. Japanese troops were moving on Manila, Penang and Hong Kong. At that point, it seemed a Japanese invasion of Australia was a possibility. With the mini-sub attack on Sydney and the shelling of Newcastle, it suddenly appeared imminent. Mr Andrew Roberts visited our school and told us how the Japanese attack on Sydney panicked the city's population. He also shared his father's amazing story of survival. What a lot of people don't realise is that the Japanese were far advanced in their plans to attack Australia. That Australia was, as far as they're concerned, a part of Asia, and it was a part of what they wanted to be a part of their empire. So there's no doubt that they intended on occupying Australia. That was their intention. And they'd mapped the coastline, they'd spies in, on the north coast, they're bombing down, and they were essentially preparing for an invasion. So those floodplains were active. Um, one flew across Sydney Harbour a week before the attack yeah. and one flew a day before the attack. After the float plane circled Sydney Harbour, the aircraft returned to its submarine, reporting the presence of battleships and cruisers anchored in the harbour. The Japanese hoped to create panic within Australia, as well as stopping the flow through the harbour. So that day we were well prepared. The, the float plane had actually went back to the submarine to report the location of the Chicago. Mm -hmm. When it landed, it actually um, capsized. Mm. It, it crashed and went on its roof. And the, the men, two men, got out and then reported back to the, um, the, the, the the submariner captain that you know, okay, everything's ready to go. And then the attack took place. At 11 p.m., air raid sirens sounded all over the city. Searchlights moved over the harbour and gunners began to fire. Sydney's residents hid in the air raid shelters. So families everywhere ran for shelter and in my case my mother pulled this dining room table into the middle room of the house and underneath it she put pillows and above it she put mattresses and around it heavy lounge room chairs and we all got underneath that. The sub-lieutenant on board M24 fired two torpedoes at Chicago, both of which missed the intended target. One ran ashore at Garden Island failing to explode whilst the second passed under the Dutch submarine K-9, striking the seawall on Garden Island. It exploded on impact beneath the moored ferry cuttable, which at the time was used as an REN depot ship and accommodation vessel. Cuttable sank immediately, and 21 Allied naval ratings, 19 Australians and two British were killed. Others were badly injured. Jap submarines invade Sydney Harbour. Their only victim, an old ferry boat converted to Navy use. Two torpedoes found their mark before the invaders were blasted to the bottom. It took a number of weeks for people to realise exactly what had happened um, to retrieve two of the midget submarines, um, one from the boom net, another one, I forget exactly where, but it was retrieved. Um, and another one went on and wasn't discovered until 2006 up in, in Brisbane water. Um, all the sailors died, the Japanese sailors died. Um, the boats, the, the, the midget subs were retrieved and the bodies were retrieved as well and they were given a military um, burial. The sub was met by a hail of light and heavy calibre shells from the guns. She appeared to be hit heavily and disappeared almost immediately. The attack on Sydney Harbour by Japanese submarines last May was a complete flop. 
The Japanese two-man submarines, possibly towed by larger submarines, paid their daring, though abortive, visit. My father happened to be on watch that night on Garden Island, so he was actually on the carnival there. So Dad heard that explosion, as didn't mean much of Sydney, it was a loud reverberation through Sydney, windows shook, uh, woke people up, people started coming down to the harbour to look see what was going on. So it was, it was not a quiet, sort of silent, stealthy mm. attack, it was, it was a major attack. These things weren't entirely accurate in terms of their sailability. So the conning tower of that sub was coming through the water with a telescope, so it was spotted. There's another one that was spotted. So people, when the spotlights found that, they were trying to attack it. So Dad was on the on the, on the wharf, and he could hear all this fuss going on, all these explosions, and he thought, well, something's up, you know, something's really up. But as happens when you finish your shift, and you finish your shift. So 12 o'clock came along and Dad's shift had finished and he's waiting, he's waiting there and his replacement never came to, came in. So as he used to be quite embarrassed to tell on his story at Garden Island every year, he, uh, he ran on board the cutable, woke this fella up in his, in his stretcher, ran back to his boat and the guy, the, the cutable had three decks so there was below deck, there was, the, there was the sort of mid deck and then there was a top deck, which was much smaller. And this man was actually sleeping in the top deck. Dad's bunk was below decks. And that was a critical thing. Had that guy not have slept in, you know, things would have been different for me. Um, because Dad ran on board, woke this fellow up, went back to his post and a few minutes later the guy came to relieve him, very apologetic, and said, look now, I'm really sorry, you know, I'm late, take my bunk and he offered Dad his bunk on the top deck. So Dad, instead of going back below decks, he went to the top deck and he jumped in this guy's bunk. And he was settling down in, into this bunk and it lifted the boat up. The man standing next to him had both of his legs shattered and he was became a cripple for the rest of his life. All the men below decks were killed. So Dad's bunk was empty and all his people that he was in there with were killed. So he was extremely lucky that this man slept in, basically. It was just one of those fortuitous things that if he'd, if he'd have woken up on time and said, OK, you know, I'll take over, Dad would have gone back to his own bunk and that would have been the end of it. While the war raged across Europe and Asia, those left behind had to suffer a combination of acute fear of invasion, worry for their loved ones fighting far from home, and domestic restrictions on food, fuel and information. I'm Cynthia Foley, I'm 80 years old and I was almost six years old in Manly in 1942 when the Japanese submarines entered Sydney Harbour. As very few people had cars, the only way to get to Sydney was by ferry and at some stage they constructed a boom gate from Greenpoint across to the other side of the harbour and the Manly ferry to Sydney had to stop while we waited for the boom gates to open. We didn't have a car. Uh, most people didn't have a car in those days, but certainly fuel rationing uh, was a major issue. And as were groceries, uh, milk, sugar, I think meat. But it was very, again, if you can recall, there were no supermarkets in those days, just small shops. And the short, it was to the small shopkeeper that you would give your um, ration tickets. And a green grocer used to come around the streets with green groceries and it was um, a totally different life to what we had known and to what we were to, to know after the war. We relied heavily on the radio because it was the only way that we were going to hear any of the news or the news that the government wanted us to hear. The sight of a telegram boy would um, instill fear in everyone in the street. Everyone was not wanting them to stop at their house. People were scared that the telegram boy would come. And I guess this was replicated in every street across Sydney because if the telegram boy came, it usually meant bad news, that someone had died, someone was been taken a POW interned. This photo is a photo of two little girls amongst crowds of thousands that were there to work on, welcome home the aircraft carrier implacable, bringing 2,100 troops home from New Guinea and our father was one of them. And even today I do get a bit upset, but this is myself and my sister. And we didn't know which was our daddy 
And the double-decker buses came up from Woolloomooloo up through the city and the soldiers were hanging out the top windows, they were hanging out the bottom windows, they were standing on the platforms of the bus and they were waving and yahooing and the crowd was waving and yahooing and we flew our flag and this is the flag. And we didn't know which was our daddy. It had been so long since we'd seen him and that was us. Years later, um, in fact in 1968, the mother of one of these sailors, these brave sailors, actually visited Australia to find out what had happened to her, to her son. So she was Mrs Matsui Matsuo. What happened then was she was met by the Prime Minister because she went to Canberra to see the, the Midget Submarine Wreck. Um, she was given an item called, it's called a Senimbari, which is essentially just a, a keepsake that was given to the sailors by their family and it involved um, the man's sister actually weaving into the Senbari a thousand red stitches and it was something that he could wear on his person. Newcastle was a prime target for the Japanese Navy. The steelworks and associated heavy industries were essential to the Allied war machine and a significant threat to Japan's success. Unknown to most people, Newcastle and most of its major industries were wired up by people called powder monkeys. So new, uh, all over BHP there were trenches laid, there was wire set down and there was explosion stores. So when the Japanese invaded, which um, predominantly people assumed would happen by sea, all they do is charge it up and then hour by hour they would blow apart BHP. BHP was so sturdily built, there's a lot of people that doubt that it would actually ever have blown up, but it wanted to damage it so much that the Japanese uh, war machine couldn't use our steel and the Japanese wanted to shell it so we couldn't use steel. It was the most important thing in the war effort at that time. So I guess th the most interesting thing for me is that this was a secret. So no one actually knew besides a few senior people in uh, the home front and military that Newcastle was wired to blow except for the powder monkeys. There were a secret group of men called powder monkeys whose job it was when this invasion happened by sea or by air or by land their job was to blow up their workplace. We didn't know they actually existed. We'd heard kind of people speak about it but no one really knew until we found a document in the BHP uh, archives down in Melbourne which gave a listing and it says that it's the distribution of powder monkeys in zone A. We have their names. We know what they were so like what they were going to blow up and we also have the timeline of how things blew up. It's kind of surprising knowing that this existed that when the Japanese did come into Newcastle Harbour and shell Newcastle in June 8, 1942 that they didn't blow the industry. So they obviously knew that they weren't uh, getting that far yet. But the shells, when they came in, they landed where Newcastle expected them to. So they landed at BHP. They were targeting the fine tool room. So that would make all the, uh, it was all the fitters and turners that would do that fine work. Uh, they also landed in Rylands and Stewart and Lloyds. So they were going for heavy industry involved in metalwork in Newcastle. Fortunately for, for Newcastle, it wasn't a very successful uh, foray into it. Fort Scratchley fired back and it's one of the only land-based forts that actually did fire on the Japanese because the firing back in Darwin was done on aircraft with movable guns. You can see as the shells fall along, there's also star shells as well as that heavy artillery shells in order to illuminate the site. Some of the shells went into Parnell Place behind Fort Scratchley. Probably a misfire, really. But what they wanted to do was we had the dockyards, we had the wireworks, we had light globe factories, we had all different kinds of heavy industry right on the river where they could get to. And that's the story of June 8th.
Right now, I'm at Fort Scratchley in Newcastle, New South Wales, and behind me is where the BHP Steelworks and Ammunition Factory once stood. It took pride in producing steel and ammunition for the armed forces, and it was also one of the only sites in Australia that took raw material and produced it to a finished product. It was also a primary reason in why the Japanese submarine, the I-21, decided to shell Newcastle. Uh, a secondary reason was also to strike fear into the Australian population. Fort Scratchy was also one of the only sites in World War II Australia that had the opportunity to shoot at the Japanese and did respond. So these are the land-based cannons that fired upon the Japanese army in 1942 during the invasion of Newcastle. Um, it's still in target from where Fort Scratchley had fired at the Japanese submarine, the I-21. And these guns are still functional today. This is a letter to our project from Mrs Williams, who was nine years old when Newcastle was attacked. I lived in a house called Bonacord. It was situated in Shepherd's Place, which was off Zara Street, Newcastle East. When on the 8th of June 1942, in the early hours of the morning, we were awakened by sirens and was told to go to the air raid shelter in Parnell Place. I don't remember the shell hitting anything, but when we came out, the house across the street had their window shattered. As a nine-year-old, not a lot remained in my mind, but the terrifying noise and panic in the air raid shelter. I do believe they said the Japanese were aiming for the power station, which was in front of our house, Bon Accord. In 1942, my grandfather worked as an overhead crane driver at Lysart Steelworks, which later became part of BHB Newcastle. He was working a night shift when the Japanese submarine shelled Newcastle. Three shells landed within the steelworks. One hurtled through the large open doors of the building where my grandfather was working. It bounced on the floor before hitting a steel workbench, which sent it spinning through the workshop and then disappeared beneath a pile of scrap metal. At first, no one knew what it was. My grandfather was asked to bring a crane down to remove the scrap metal. When he did, they realised it was a bomb. Luckily for me, it failed to explode, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. A controversial piece of history is the Brisbane Lion strategy. Whether it was a plan, and if it was, whether it was a plan to surrender the top half of Australia or a strategy to defend the southern and most populated half of Australia. The fear of imminent Japanese invasions forced authorities in Australian coastal cities to implement domestic restrictions like nighttime blackouts on homes and cars and most controversially a scorched earth policy whereby the north of Australia would be sacrificed to save the south. I was at Korakai for quite a few years and then went to Evans Head and it, uh, all of the places around, little towns and, and country around, used to have to be blacked out at night because they didn't want light showing if the Japanese were searching to see what, what was where. And we had blackout curtains, there was no light came out of the building. And if you went once to go anywhere at night, you couldn't take a vehicle out unless it had blackout lights on, which meant they were covered with, I'm not, I think it was tin, and there were slits in them that the light from the headlights just went down onto the road. In towns, there was somebody went round the town to make sure there was no little bit of light coming down from a window somewhere. You didn't go out a whole lot at night because uh, there was petrol rationing too and most cars got two gallons of petrol, or they were allowed two gallons of petrol a month. After Darwin was bombed, they had, they had planned something that they called the Brisbane Line and where they drew a line across the map. If people were evacuating up there, they were told to burn the buildings and burn any crops or anything that the Japanese could use. And so that was the scorched earth policy. The idea was that there'd be nothing there for the Japanese if they wanted to 
then there they would have to supply their own. If the Japanese had come in, farmers in all directions were prepared to fight them. Naturally, being farmers, they could ride, and I would say 99% of them would have had a gun of some description. The Japanese had overrun so, many, so much up till then, and they, they really, people didn't know what was ahead. The further south the Australians could get, the safer they'd be. Evidence of Australia's defence of the southern states can be seen along the New South Wales and Queensland borders. Tank traps across the Clarence River were designed to impede an attack by land and funnel advancing troops to strategic ambush points. Shipping along Australia's coast was vulnerable to attack by both Japanese and German submarines and sea mines. Volunteer coast watchers often witnessed and recorded attacks, as in this remarkable account by a young volunteer who witnessed the sinking of the William Dorse off the coast of Tarthra, as told by her brother. Lorna happened to be on duty. She came on duty the morning just after the William Dawes was torpedoed off Tartha by a Japanese submarine. The, uh, the skipper of the William Dawes, which had sailed from Adelaide in South Australia, was the next port of call to have been Sydney. Uh, the skipper arrived at Eden. He was forewarned of uh, Japanese submarine activity on the New South Wales coast and set off north up the coast. And he got as far as Tartha, which I think is about a mile and a half or two miles offshore, and he copped a Japanese submarine. The ship didn't meet, didn't sink uh, immediately. It, it stopped afloat for quite a few hours. And uh, in the meantime, my sister came on duty and she went up the tower and she had good quality binoculars and was able to observe everything through binoculars from the observation post. It took us about three hours or so before the ship actually sank. Anyway, eventually the ship sank about 10 o'clock. And in the meantime, Sister Lorna was dotting down sketches from the observation tower which we have a good record of, and uh, that's a kind of a reference point now to what actually happened. If it wasn't for the treaty in 1957, Australia and Japan would not have the prosperous and positive relationship we have today. The opportunity to produce an insightful historical project has not only allowed us as students to learn in diverse ways, but also to access material from incredible primary sources. We've been able to work collaboratively as a group to tell the little known history on the attacks along Australia's east coast and put this part of history into context of war in the Pacific during World War II. We'd also like to thank the tremendous support and opportunity from our principal, Mr. Ma, head teacher of Hizzy, Mr. Tran, Mr. Johnston, and Ms. Hitchcock. We are truly grateful to have been able to be a part of this project.